No doubt this is the hardest to understand theory that we'll come across during the course, but it's also something extremely valuable. Moral foundations theory provides us with an approach to understanding cultural variation in moral psychology. So where are we? I'm looking at this claim by uh, Feinberg and Willer, the second of five claims. Um, and part of the claim is the idea that there are multiple, that's to say more than one, fundamental domains of human morality, right? So we've been thinking particularly about harm and purity. So this is a claim the claim that they want to make is a claim about similarities and differences in morality across cultures. But what are they claiming about it? What they're claiming is that moral foundations researchers, so these are researchers who are using moral foundations theory, have investigated similarities and differences among individuals across cultures and found evidence for these fundamental domains of human morality. So let's now take a look at that claim. You notice that uh, Feinberg and Willer are citing Haidt and Joseph here, uh, and there's a variety of actually a, a long series of papers on this. So let's take a look at that. Moral foundations theory aims to provide a systematic theory of morality, explaining its origins, development, and cultural variations. Just the thing we need. Now, I'm going to tell you later that I think that there are both some empirical objections to the main results that people claim to have derived from moral foundations theory, and also some theoretical problems. In fact, we've already seen one theoretical problem uh, with moral foundations theory in a different guise. So you might be thinking, Steve, you know, why are you, why are you telling us about moral foundations theory at all? This thing, I think, you know, it's deeply flawed. It's extremely problem problematic. And on top of that, the proponents of this theory in their review papers appear to ignore the strongest evidence against their theory. They simply don't mention it at all. So that to me makes me think, you know, look, I don't want to mention this at all in my lectures. I'm not interested. I'll go and find some other theory, right? Theories are quite plentiful. But you know what? I was reading uh, the work of some of the harshest critics of moral foundations theory, and they provide, I think, a very strong defense for it, a very good reason why we should consider the theory, even though we should be extremely cautious in how we use it. So here's Davis and colleagues who are critics, they're really opponents of the theory. And they say, it would be difficult to overestimate the influence of this theory on psychological science. For a very good reason. For a very good reason, right? Because it caused a dramatic broadening in conceptualization of morality beyond narrow Western notions that have focused on individualistic virtues associated with protecting one's rights. So moral foundations theory is useful because it's allowed this tremendous piece of progress. But they also go on to say, and remember these are providing, these researchers, Davis and colleagues, are providing some of the best evidence against moral foundations theory, that there is significant support for moral foundations hypothesis, that, which predicts that conservatives tend to draw on virtues associating with binding communities more than liberals. So conservatives tend to be, socially conservative people, tend to be uh, putting more weight on factors like purity, loyalty, obedience, authority in making moral judgments than people who are uh, socially liberal, according to these critics of moral foundations theory. So I think we need to be cautious here. Moral foundations theory has various interesting problems, but the theory itself is extremely valuable and interesting. So what is moral foundations theory? I think moral foundations theory is the conjunction of four claims. Four claims. The first one is a claim about nativism. So the claim is that what they put this by saying there's a first draft of the moral mind. What they mean is that you and I are born with certain moral capacities. But they call this a first draft because they also think that moral psychology, human moral psychology, is influenced by processes of cultural learning. So that first draft, the innate capacities, are, according to them, edited during development within a culture. So the claim. So yes, they're nativists, but they also think that there is a role for learning. The third claim is a big one. The third claim is actually <laughs> a series of claims in itself. Uh, this is that the social intuitionist model is true. 
What's the social interest model? Good, good question. What is the social interestness model? We came across this briefly before. It's summarized in this diagram. So what are we supposed to understand here? Well, the diagram is supposed to provide a causal model of how people form ethical judgments um, and how their ethical judgments then lead to reasoning. Now, the social intuitionist model itself is quite a complicated thing to understand. I don't claim myself to fully understand it, but I think there are two claims which are particularly important. The first one is that moral evaluations generally occur rapidly and automatically. They're products of relatively effortless heuristic processing that you might call system one thinking, system one thinking. Uh, and that's actually supposed to be a gloss, I think, on this arrow. The idea here is that the intuition, this, this stuff here, is supposed to be the kind of representation that underpins those fast, uh, effortless processes which support judgment. Then the second key claim that I think we find is that moral reasoning is done primarily for social strategic purposes. So on the social intuitionist model, uh, reasoning is something which in the individual case tends to follow judgment and is used as a way to sort of substantiate a judgment that you have already made. But it is supposed to have an important role socially in between people in causing their intuitions to align. This is really how cultural learning is supposed to work according to moral foundations theory. It's via social processes of reasoning that a community's intuitions can be changed and aligned. Here, of course, we're using the term intuition in a different way from that that I normally use on this course. So I think an intuition is just an unreflective judgment for the most part. But here we're not using it in that way. Here we're thinking that an intuition is a, uh, a disposition or a heuristic which is used in these fast, effortless processes which lead to judgments. That's what intuition has to mean in this context. All right, good. So here we've got the third claim of moral foundations theory. This is the social intuition, intuitionist model. Now, interestingly, this is really a piece of philosophy as much as it is a piece of psychology. So it rewards study in its own right, I think. The fourth and last claim is the claim that there are many psychological foundations of morality. And this is the claim, indeed, that we were looking at in the previous section, the idea that we should be pluralists when it comes to moral psychology. We should recognise that concerns about harm and concerns about purity are both legitimate moral concerns, or descriptively, anyway, legitimate moral concerns, but they're also these incommensurably different categories, just different categories. The important thing here is um, when they're talking about foundations, they're really talking about broad categories, broad categories. So if I talk about harm, I'm not talking about a particular moral concern, I'm talking about a general category of moral concern, where the harm can be, of course, you know, take, take many different take many different forms. Uh, harm can be due to a problem, violation of property rights as much as a violation of the physical body. All right, um, the other thing to say here is that what they're stressing is that there are many psychological foundations of morality. So what we'll see later is that moral foundations theorists typically work with five particular foundations, but that isn't a key part of the theory itself. The key claim of the theory is just what it says here, the pluralism, the idea that there's more than one. Once you've got from zero, uh, once you've got from one to two, it's not a massive step to five or six or to add in a few more of those foundations. That's not what's important. The important thing here is the pluralism. Very good. All right. So I hope now we've understood something of this second claim that Feinberg and Willer are making. We spent two sections on this because there's an awful lot behind the claim. Moral foundations theory is the framework in which Feinberg and Willer are working, and which as far as I know, all of the research on understanding the consequences of differences in moral psychology for political conflict takes place. This is the theory that we have to refer to in order to understand that research. One of the questions for us is going to be, well, to what extent do we need every element of the theory? So if I go back to those four claims, I might ask myself, you know, it looks a bit like a parlay bet. 
looks a bit like a parlay bet. Now, there's nothing wrong with a parlay bet if the odds are good, but a parlay bet isn't a theory. Right? A parlay bet is just a series of bets that happen to go together. Is there a way to break this down? So, for example, when it comes to that nativism, is that doing some explanatory work for us in our concern with understanding political conflict? If it's not, perhaps we can avoid some of the commitments of moral foundations theory, but still benefit from all of the applications. So, one of the questions about moral foundations theory that you will need to consider, you're the philosopher, is, you know, do I need the whole theory or can I just take a, com a small components of it? Can I back off some of the claims and still get all of the interesting applications? But I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there because you see, the claim is not just that we have a theory. Right. If we're doing philosophy, we'd just be like, oh, we've got a theory. That's great. Well done us. Uh, the claim here is that that theory is actually supported by evidence. We can be confident that it's true because we've collected evidence for it. So let's now go and take a look. What's the evidence for this theory?